to the forefront so when the enemy tries to do his thing, it bounces off the silhouette, the silhouette of Jesus Christ in our life. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the... No, if you'll find out the setting that God put that, or, or Paul, uh, excuse me, that John put that in, <clears throat> he was talking about there's a place you can dwell where Satan can't touch it. <clears throat> I don't know why my throat's so scratchy, sorry. It wasn't earlier. <laughs> but I always got to be careful. <clears throat> I'm on camera. I'm still not used to that after all these years. So when we put Jesus' forefront, the enemy sees him, backs off. So I, I learned that pretty uh, late in my Christianity because I was one of those screamers and rebukers stomping around. I'm taking authority. Oh, I took authority. Why didn't it work? Because a lot of times we're not convinced that it works, but we're yelling like it does. Someone say amen. You don't need to yell at the devil. You just need to let Jesus open and speak out through you. Jesus' name, he'll just tremble. Amen. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <clears throat> now, you have two mouths. You have a sour mouth, a bitter mouth. Yeah, that would look funny if you had two mouths. But anyway, you have, you have a bitter mouth. It comes from the old man. Those side comments, you know, that were in the brain, came out of the mouth. Amen. And then you have a sweet water mouth where it comes out of your spirit. The key is for you and I is to learn to walk in the sweet water, to drink from the sweet water. Because as a man soweth, so shall he also reap. So if you're, if you're giving everybody a, a thing or two and letting them know how you think, and <coughs> all that's going to come back on you. Many people I've known through the years were just mean, mean Christians. And they'd pick on people and tell them to straighten up, you know, the holiness group. And next thing I know, after about three weeks of that, it'd be all on them. You know, I felt like saying, how you doing, Bunky? <laughs> Is it working for you now? <laughs> Because we miss some of the simplest bits of wisdom and knowledge that God wants us to understand. Say, that's you, not me. <laughs> huh? <clears throat> Nobody in here. Amen. All right. So it goes on further to say, he's head of all principality and what? So guess what? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, power, Spiritual wickedness, high places. Amen. Amen. And I missed a couple. But these different levels of evil. Amen. There's a, what we call the principalities. Everyone say principality. It's a Greek word, arche, where we get ar archangel. <coughs> so a principality is somebody who thinks they're in charge. Now, we have two principalities that are on our side, on Jesus' side, Michael and Gabriel. But there was a third one that fell. Can anybody tell me why Lucifer fell? He was the most strongest of all of them. Pride. Now, one of the keys that for us to know is if you want to have a bad week, operate your week in pride. I did it my way. Now, I understand there's a certain amount of training that you've received that you have to do it certain, a certain way and it's sort of your way, but really not. The wisdom, all wisdom comes from God. All good wisdom. So even though we're trained, like some of you are great carpenters, okay, and when you operate in carpentry, you do it because you've been trained to do it that way, but God's right there now Helping you. So it's even better. 
I've been trained how to play the drums, <coughs> but I play them better when Jesus is playing them through me. I'm sure, too, you, brother, well, you're a great machinist. You know, he might not say that, but, you know, but we're even better when, when, when we let Jesus work through us, right? He can remind us of something we might overlook or something like that. Amen. But remember, God has deposited us in, in our heart as seed. So if you have faith as a seed, if you have patience as a seed, which you do, if you have <clears throat> uh, love as a seed, it needs to be what? Developed. And if we don't become doers of the word, if we don't practice the word, we're just on hiatus, uh, then what happens is the seed doesn't develop as much as it should. So we've got people who've been saved 40 years, maybe 30 years, maybe 20 years, maybe even 10 years. And the seed is still hardly germinated. And you see them. They're doing great in church. They got the Christian needs going, you know, all these things. I don't want to meddle too much. But when they get in the parking lot <laughs> and dear old sister so-and-so pulls out in front of them, <laughs> amen. So we've all had that instability in our life. So let's go down. Let's go back to Colossians. But chapter 1. You and I must learn to put our focus, even our heart, making Jesus preeminent. Amen? And I, I'm, I believe today Jesus is not preeminent in the church. And I'm talking about the whole thing. In our church, maybe you put him first. But somebody who's preeminent, for example, if I have a friend that I haven't seen in a long time, I want to make that person preeminent by honoring them, putting them first, making them superior. Amen. We all probably been taught this if you were raised in a gracious home like I was. See, in my life, I didn't have dysfunctional parents. At least they were dysfunctional beyond my eyesight. Sure, they were not perfect. Sure, they were not saved. But I had a mom and dad that came to my outings they backed me when I played football and when I played and entertained as a, a rock drummer. They came and they danced and they supported. But you know, there are people who have not, didn't have that in their life and there's some that did. You can't regulate your life by the function of other people because we don't know backgrounds. But I do know the word will work in everybody's life if they will get the seed in a place where it can develop. Can you say amen? And so if we look at ourselves... We're going to live a crooked life because our eyes will go to the Lord and then we look at ourselves and go to the Lord and look at ourselves. James calls it double-mindedness. We're unstable in all our ways. But say today, I'm going to learn just a little bit more about stability. All right, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. First thing it says is he is, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Can you think of any other scriptures that say that? Over in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter one. He is the image of the Father's person. Amen? He is the impressed image of the Father's person. Remember Jesus said to Philip, Philip says, well, Jesus, show us the Father that it might satisfy us. And Jesus, what did he say? <clears throat> He that has seen me has seen the Father. So I'm going to tell you, you might not agree with it, but if you've seen Jesus in a vision or seen Jesus through the scripture, you've seen the Father. Turn around, wave at the camera. You were. <laughs> Do I know these people? <laughs> He that has seen me, yeah, thank you. He then, my wife. (laughs) 
He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You might know it, but the Holy Spirit, even though one of his functions is to be is invisible in our teacher, but if he manifested, he has a body like the Father and like the Son, and he looks like the Father and the Son. Hello, different functioning. Jesus has a different function. The Father has a different function. And in <coughs> several weeks, when I teach about the gifts of the Spirit, you'll see that everything, <clears throat> the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are all involved in every work that is done. The Father calls, the Holy Spirit draws, and Jesus saves. Okay. Now, if you come from like a oneness or a Jesus-only background, it's okay. You're still saved if you accepted Christ. But they hide from you the reality of the Father and the reality of the Spirit a little bit. So what happens, it becomes Jesus-only. And even though our focus is Christ, because the Father's going to ask you when you get to heaven, what did you do with my son? How much did you accept? How much did you obey him? Now, I don't want to be going, oh, you, uh, you, you, you stand before the Lord. As much as I could, Lord, but I couldn't do it without your help. Amen. Good answer, I would say, just because it's honest. Okay, he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over, look at the phrase, over all creation. Jesus is over all what? Everything that's been created. His name is above every name that is named, whether in heaven, earth, or under the earth. And at the name of Jesus, not the name of Yahweh, not the name of El Shaddai, even those are great names of God. They're descriptive names of God. Jesus is not a descriptive name of God only. It's the very essence of the power of God through Christ making things legal for you and I. See, Jesus died and rose again and made it available for us to access the throne of God, not based on our own ability, but through Christ. Wow, this blows my mind. Amen. He said, in that day you shall ask me nothing. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So we don't ignore the Father. We address the Father, but we address him with his Son and honoring preeminently his Son. Just like we sang that song earlier. His, say the name of Jesus. Say the name of Jesus, amen. But see, a lot of people just say, Jesus, I said that name. Say the name, bring it right out of you, of Jesus. I remember the first miracle that God allowed me to experience. Can I tell you about it? Back in, back in the day when we lived in Prairie Ridge, I lived in Prairie Ridge, raised in Prairie Ridge, Revival broke out in Prairie Ridge. And a part of that revival, uh, I, I ministered out of Buckley, Washington. Anybody know where Buckley is? Amen. It's that chosen town. I went to school. Seriously. <laughs> I just believe it. And I used to minister. There's a, there was a little Odd fellow, Fellows Hall. Not the, not the Masonic Temple, but the Odd Fellows Hall was all log cabin. And I had just my first meeting there, and my cousin was gone, and so I got to preach. And there's probably 40 people there. And uh, the Suprax, anybody here remember the Suprax? Paul and Sharon had, uh, I think they had a couple of ch two daughters and a son. If I mess that up, Suprax, you can, you can call me on it. <clears throat> but the son, his name was Michael. He was just a baby, an infant. And so, next thing I know, Paul Suprak was walking up with his wife with their baby in their hands and said, uh, Brother Kerry, they didn't call me pastor back then. I was too green. Uh, Brother Kerry, would you pray over our son? 
And I looked down at the, at the child. I've never seen this before. Of course, I've seen it since. The little child was cross-eyed, <clears throat> really bad, just like that. And, and, you know, if I would have just dwelt at that for a long, long time, my natural man would have kicked in. Don't, uh, when you're praying for the sick, when you're praying for miracles, don't let your natural man kick in. <laughs> like Naaman, don't let your natural man kick in. And I said, well, Lord, I know that you can do everything. And I looked at them. I told them both. I says, look, I can't do a thing, but Jesus can do everything. And as clumsy as I was, I just put my hands on the child. I didn't even lay hands on his eyes. Put my hands on the child. And I said, Father, thank you for healing this child. And they gave me a little Michael, and I lifted him up, and I said, thank you, Lord. Gave him back, and they looked into his eyes, and they were straight and glistening with God's presence on it so much. You know, and I believe God that way, that God has ways to, uh, our God has a way of encouraging us as we continue on in our walk. And man, the whole place just came alive. Wow, well, look at this and all that. And so that was the beginning of my, my uh, entering into the, the ministry and uh, getting asked to preach more often. My preaching was awful. I don't know if it's so good today. But I used to say things, you slide to hell on your buns and think my dad would go, <laughs> you know, and God had to clean and work with me. But you know what? That's exactly what he does. He never gives, us on, gives up on us. He never quits on us. He keeps on working through all of our goofiness. I'm so glad. How many are glad? So he's Lord over all creation. For by him all things were created. By who? By Jesus. I had a guy not long ago, about a year ago, said to me, well, Jesus didn't become the only begotten and the only son of God until he was born in the earth. He was the son of God in heaven too. He was God in heaven. Why? Because all things were created by him and for him. Nothing was made that was made without him. John 1. So look at this. By him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, and, and powers. All things were created through him and for him. Believe me, I tell you, it is exciting to have the creator live in us. A couple points I want to give you. Number one, Jesus is the image of the Father. Ask God to give you a picture of him. Two, he is the firstborn over all creation. He's Lord. So learn to release him when you speak. Learn to speak him so he can fight for you. Amen? Satan, if you don't get out of here, I'm turning Jesus loose. Try that. Works. And you say, well, what gives you the right to turn Jesus lo loose? Jesus. He bought and paid for that right and gave it to me. I become more than a conqueror. Are you with me? Thirdly, by him all things are created in heaven and in earth. Satan was created not as Satan, but as Lucifer by Jesus. That's why it's such ludicrous uh, wisdom when Satan came to Jesus and said, if you be the son of God. He knew he was the son of God. Jesus created him, but not as Satan. What about the scriptures says, I created the destroyer to destroy? Well, God knew that he became evil, so he's just going to use him as a pawn. Okay? Listen, yeah. So not on his children, <clears throat> but on his foes. Amen. Remember the time where they started singing the beauty of God's holiness and it says God sent ambushments into the camp and they began killing off each other? Yeah, that's God using Satan as a pawn against evil. 
God will never use the devil against you. Amen? Nor does he take pride in that happening. The school of circumstances is not our school. We have the school of God. Can you say amen? I want you to uh, make sure that you get a copy of this. Yes. <laughs> all right. All things were created through him and by him. Amen? All right. John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. As we go down further in Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 17. And this is where the, we get this term that Jesus needs to be up in front and before all things, before you, before me, before our problems. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Everyone say can consist. It means glued together. Your marriage will be glued together when Jesus stands in the center of it. When we consult him about what we're going to say to our spouse, our business, I pray for you and your businesses and all. We'll hold together and begin to prosper when Jesus is in the center of it. The church, this church name is Christ-Centered Ministries. Everything that we do, we try to focus on Jesus when we do it. So God holds us together. I mean, there have been times where I thought, Lord, what are you doing? I need to be down at the church that I love dearly. I was asked to be on staff. I was asked, it's like running four to 5,000 now. And I went to God, I said, God, why, God, why? And God said, I didn't call you to that. I called you to, to create a precedence and te- what I, teach what I taught you. Now I realize I teach a little different way than some people. But I believe that's because God wants me to teach this way. I, I didn't come up, the, up on it my own. He just wants me to teach. And so he's given me things to give you that will help you understand the word of God, I hope, in a greater way. God wants us to honor him and to put his son first as the center of our life. Jesus should be before all things and still is. Amen? Let's go down to verse 18, Colossians chapter 1. And we're done with you. Now, Colossians 18 is really cool because it says, for he is the head of the body. So we need to hold fast to Jesus as Jesus holds fast to us. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Why is he called that? Can you recall? Why is Jesus called the firstborn from the dead? Because he was the first one born from the dead. I could go into great detail, but I don't want to. Jesus came as a man, anointed by God. This is really hard to believe. Why? Because a man had to die for man. A man for mankind. All of mankind was born through Adam, what we call a sin culture. Sin was passed on to every man. Death passed on to every man, Romans 5. Except for Jesus. His blood was pure. His body was pure. There was no way to kill Jesus except with God the Father laying our sin on him. So I want to, next time you get to feeling really full of yourself, realize that your sin killed Jesus. If there wasn't anybody else's sin, your sin killed Jesus. So if he paid the price for our sin, we ought to stop. Amen? With God's help. <coughs> And he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, everyone say all things. There's a lot of alls in the Bible. Some alls pertain to life and godliness. Some alls mean everything. But Jesus in this all things 
is everything. And in all things that he might have the preeminence. Everyone say preeminent. If my wife is preeminent in my household, that means I set out the, the plates for her. I set out her chair. I make the bed for her. I give her the honor. Some of you are claiming that now. <laughs> I give her the honor that's due her. Honor, give honor to whom honor is due. Amen. So Jesus is preeminent. So he's head of the church, the body of Christ. No abuse, but lots of use in the body. Someone says, you know, I'm tired of being used in the body. Wrong wordage. If you're tired of being urged, used in the body, then you're going to pew warm. What you really mean is I'm tired of being abused. Hello. Abuse is demonic. Use is godly. Amen. Aren't you glad you can use your hand to write letters? Aren't you glad you can use your hands to type? Amen. But thank God you don't have a job where you're abused and overtyping. <laughs> you used to be good. <laughs> what is that? What do they call that input? When you're inputting a thing all day long? Data entry, that's what it is. Amen. All right, done. three more points. In everything, he, Jesus Christ, must have preeminence. Amen. He means he's head, he's honored, he's above everything that you do. That means that you consult him before you make a major decision in your life. Amen. Now, we might, I, I know I've fallen in love with a lot of people before I married Linda. Amen. And I had a lot of people, and I'm not bragging on this, please. As soon as I became single, the women came out of the woodwork. God forbid. And with me, I'm kind of personality. It's hard to turn down anything. But I can turn down sin. Amen. And, and man, boom, boom, boom. Oh, God told me to marry you. I knew this was just going to happen. I said, God did not. I know him personally. And then when Linda and I dated, I'm going to give you a little bit of information. It was nine years, Scott, I dated her. Because I didn't want, if we got together and married, I didn't want to wreck the relationship like I, I wrecked the other. I take the blame for the other thing, you know. Not that I did anything masterfully wrong, but, you know, somebody has to make the initial decision. So, <laughs> so I dated you a long time, didn't I? What was your statement? You either marry me or I'm gone. <laughs> she waited. She's patient. I thank God for you, sweetie. Amen. So in all things, our key to stability is putting God first. If you seek God first in the morning, say, Lord, set me up. You know, get me focused in the right direction. Fill me with your spirit. I know I was filled yesterday, but today fill me again in your spirit so that my disposition is going to be polite, you know, because I can get frustrated. And when I do, I use it, end up saying something. I remember one time, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, and we're going to close. But uh, somebody had sat on all my boxes of Kleenexes. They were all crushed. And I'm sitting here, and this is when the church was bigger, God forbid, and I'm looking at all of the cleanings. They're all crushed, every one of them. And I, without consulting Jesus, I opened my mouth and said, who's crushing the Kleenex? Oh, it made somebody so mad that I would think to look at the Kleenex boxes and not, you know. So I, I apologize for that. But it's just like life, isn't it? We're noticing this, not paying attention to the sermon, but we're noticing this, this is out of order, we're moving here, we're moving there. Wrong. You're supposed to trust God and God make God preeminent over things. To me, I'm much happier of an individual. So if you want stability in your life, consult him on everything. 
let his preeminence absorb into your thinking and to your living. So that means, and this is real hard to say because I know all of us fit this. That means God picks your wife. God helps you in your business. Because if you're pursuing someone that's not quite there yet, but then you've got to be patient. They might be there. God might have said, this is the one. But you see no evidence of it. Don't force things. Maybe you see that so-and-so. See, I saw Eric being an usher a year ago. But he wasn't ready. So I went to him and he goes, God forbid. <laughs> And he's thinking of this and thinking, I'm not ready. This is the only time that, you know. And I'm saying, see, if we coerce and force, we step out into ourselves and things don't work as well. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord praise? We praise you, Father.